All right, I'd like to call our meeting uh, to order and uh, we'll call all members of council are present. Um, we're gonna dispense with the land acknowledgement that was uh, done at an earlier meeting. Uh, any disclosure of uh, pecuniary interest on the agenda is presented to you this evening. Okay. Hearing none, uh, we do have uh, delegations and it's uh, on the shoreline management uh, plan, a coastal flood risk uh, assessment report. We have uh, Peter Suzik uh, of Zuzik uh, Incorporated and uh, Brian, I don't know if there's anything you, uh, you don't want to be, or, or sorry, public works. I, yeah. I don't want to give you, a, you know, sorry about that, uh, Mr. Bartnick. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, normally, I would prepare kind of a, a summary of the administrative report, uh, but I think the presentation that Peter Zuzik has uh, in, in front of you today is very informative, and uh, yes. I think I'm just going to pass it off to Peter, and uh, and then we'll, uh, administration will be here to to help uh, answer any questions that uh, that might come up. All right, thank you very thank much. You. Well, I know it's, uh, it's it's we've been waiting, uh, you know, for this report, obviously, uh, of, uh, re you know, really great interest in particular um, since 16 and 17. And, uh, certainly the high lake levels and, and uh, you know, the the whole climate change piece and the effect that it has here. So uh, very timely. And so we're looking forward to uh, to your report uh, this evening. All right, thank you, Your Worship, and Phil, thank you for the introduction. Uh, thanks for the chance to be here tonight, and it is, uh, it is uh, a great chance to explain the study. It was a very comprehensive piece of work, and I look forward to walking you through some of the key aspects of it and the findings, and then, of course, have any questions or dialogue. So, let's see. Um, I think... So blue lights on. Okay. All right. So I think we're all well aware of the, of the study area here, but it is obviously the the town of Tecumseh, and and primarily focusing on the on the lakeshore, of course, these interior lands up to the uh, the CN rail tracks. So what I'd like to do tonight is, is walk you through some of the key aspects of the field data collection, the coastal hazard analysis, the flood risk assessment, the adaptation options, uh, the public engagement, of course, which is really important, and then talk about some next steps and take any questions you may have. So firstly, the, the field data collection. We flew a drone uh, along the entire shoreline to collect photos like you see up on the screen here, Pike Creek, uh, the western boundary, to get these digital images of your shoreline so that we could refer to that throughout the study. And these are really uh, a valuable resource for us to understand the site conditions, how they change. But also specifically, we are looking at a lot by lot assessment here, as we'll see a little bit later. And so it's very important for us to understand what kind of uh, shore protection might exist on each individual lot. And then that leads to the, the shore protection database. So we use that oblique uh, photo information uh, linked together with a property parcel database. And then we're categorizing the type of shore protection if it's present along this entire stretch of shoreline. And so in that first uh, pie graph there with the red, uh, we can see that we have um, the right laser. Okay, right here. 92% uh, of your shoreline features some type of hardening, some type of shore protection, uh, with 8% of it being natural. We move to the middle graphic there and 92%, and you know, these are estimates, of course, because we don't have property parcel ownership data, but roughly 92% of it is privately owned. And this is really important as well as we think about options and solutions because much of these lands that are flood prone along the lake are held in private private uh, ownership. And then the third pie chart uh, to the to the right here is uh, just showing you the type of structures and uh, the 82% there we have uh, lots of uh, vertical walls, sea walls, uh, and we're quite familiar with those. I'm sure these vertical structures that are present along the shoreline. We also did uh, a lot of work with the boat and we traversed uh, the entire shoreline, uh, collecting information on the depths of the lake bottom. 
We also use a, a sonar, which is the, the colorful image here that's characterizing the bottom. So we have a good understanding of whether the bottom is made of sand, where the rocks are. Um, you can see just to get a sense of the level of detail here, we're picking up the individual piles on this dock structure here. So a very detailed uh, bit of data collection. And then that feeds into developing uh, information on, on the depths of the lake, which is this profile here. So this is a shore perpendicular line out into the lake to give us an idea of how deep things are. Uh, and then we have the detailed information on the shoreline as well. This would be the, the shoreline protection structure here. So all very important information for us to feed into the, the flood hazard assessment. And of course, then layering information like the 100 year flood level here, which is the blue line. Okay. We had uh, J.D. Barnes helping, did a very detailed uh, survey along the shoreline. So we can see all the dots there on the lower panel. Uh, but looking at the top two images, we're collecting, they collected information on the height of every structure, shoreline protection structure along the, the shoreline, in some cases, multiple shots along the, the property boundary, as well as the depth at the toe of the wall. And those are very important things for us to be able to calculate the volume of water that can come over these shorelines during a flood event. All right, so there's, there was more, but those are some highlights and hopefully set the context that we did a lot of background technical work here to, as part of this study. Then we focus here on coastal hazards in the, the red book, orange book there cover is uh, the historical document, 1976. And so there was work to be done to update some of the extremes uh, that are uh, important for your study area. Uh, and looking at climate change as well was a big part of this. Uh, I think we're all quite, familiar now with this story. It's warming. I don't want to tell you today that it's getting warmer in the winter. Um, it's uh, 11 degrees today. The, the graphic on the far right is, is sort of a, a late century projection for a business as usual. So if we don't uh, get our emissions under control, we could see winter temperatures six, seven, eight degrees warmer uh, than the long-term averages. And, and that has a lot of implications. Uh, one of them that we, I think, can all relate to is ice. And so the graphics along the bottom is Lake Sinclair with a lot of ice, uh, Lake Sinclair with a little bit, and then Lake Sinclair with none, which would be closer to what we have today. And of course, the obvious connection here is if the lake is not frozen over in the winter, you now have more exposure to winter storm events, more flooding events are going to impact the shoreline over time. And then we have water levels. The uh, long-term record is in blue. We have time on the x-axis. So we have 1918 all the way to 2020 in the far right. And we know that the lake goes through periods of highs and lows as we go through wet cycles and warm cycles or dry cycles. The, the key takeaway here, we do lots of statistical work and we focus on something referred to as the 100 year flood level. This is a water level that accounts for storm impacts that has a 1% chance of occurring in any given year. So any year, uh, this 100 year level could happen with a 1% probability. And we use that for the mapping, that's a provincial standard to do the mapping uh, and map the floodplains. That's the orange line you see here. And so the reason it's higher than these measured levels is it accounts for the storm surge, as I said. What we're looking at with the climate change, and this is based on some of the latest research from Environment Canada, with a warmer atmosphere, we're expecting these wet periods like we just went through in 2018, 2019, 2020, to become wetter. And so the best science we have suggests that the 100 year lake level in the future could go up on the order of 30 centimeters. So think about all of the challenges we faced along the shoreline with flooding in 2019, and then think about the shoreline with another foot of water on it. And that's what we're assessing as part of this work. And that's what we're doing all across the province to help communities uh, build in resilience along their shoreline uh, for these future impacts of climate change. Certainly waves are important, and, and this gets pretty technical here, but we a lot of work uh, looking at wind speeds, which is the graphic on the left, uh, and then looking at the, the return period probabilities. Again, how frequent are these wave heights? What we're looking at uh, for the flood work is uh, wave heights with a return period of 100 years. Again, that 1% chance event, uh, wind speeds of 90 plus kilometers, 
generally giving us wave heights of 1.6 meters uh, here in the Tecumseh shoreline. So this is all uh, background work that helps us understand your flood risks and the volume of water that could overtop your shoreline. Uh, waves again uh, in deep water, but we we want to know what the waves are like right at the shoreline. So the the squiggly line are all the tracks from the boat. So these colored lines along the shoreline are the depths, color coded. Orange is shallow, and blue is deep. Uh, we're using again that detailed information collected on the boat to uh, assess what the wave conditions are right at the sea walls where the waves are striking the walls and overtopping the shoreline. We also looked at uh, flooding and rainfall events uh, coinciding with uh, the lake events. And so uh, there's been obviously a lot of discussion in the community here about rainfall events and work to mitigate that. Uh, when we started looking at this, scoping out this study with your staff, uh, we wanted to make sure we looked at the possibility of a big coastal storm but also the joint probability of that happening during a rainfall event as well. And so that's been integrated into this work. The graphic on, on the bar chart shows you the, the top uh, 140 so wind storms uh, that impact the shoreline and then the amount of rainfall. So you can see that it, you know, more than half the time when you're getting a flooding, potential flooding event, it is also raining. So we wanna be able to factor that into the analysis as well. So on, on to the, the flood risk assessment now. So you know what, what are we looking at here with the current infrastructure? Before we speak about that, we, we have seen floods here before. And I think the, uh, the, the St. Patrick's Day flood, a couple of photographs of it there are a good reminder of what has happened here uh, in the past. A couple more photographs. Again, the St. Patrick's Day storm in 1973 was a, a major event. Uh, and it caused a lot of flooding. We can see the extent of the floodwaters along Riverside Drive, Tecumseh Road, Arlington Boulevard. Uh, there's lots of numbers up there, but I think there's most important thing I want you to take away from this is that A, this has happened in the past, but B, you are at the same levels in 2019 as this storm. The only difference is you didn't have a wind event. So you, this community and many others around the Great Lakes got really lucky because you had all the makings with the volume of water in this lake, Lake St. Clair, to have this flood, you just didn't have the storm to generate the waves. And so I think that's a really important takeaway. I want everyone to, to understand that you got really lucky, uh, but this could happen again. And if it happens with a wind event, then you're gonna have this kind of flooding again in your community. So to assess the, the risk to buildings and infrastructure, we built a database. And so each one of those yellow dots are the buildings within the study area. Uh, we can see the little yellow dots on the top right there representing the structures. And we did a lot of work during COVID, so it was not easy to uh, establish the, the flooding elevations that are vulnerable for these homes. We looked at things like lowest openings, whether there's basement windows on the lower right here. We also use some innovative techniques to come up with a, an estimate of the main floor elevation so that we could look at the, the vulnerability of all these homes in the geography with respect to the depth of flooding. And that's what the, the next graphic is showing you here. This is some methodology that comes from the US uh, with both FEMA and the Army Corps. If we just look at the, the first graphic on the, on the left here, we have a, what's called a structure stage damage curve. And so uh, a schematic diagram here, but we're looking at about a foot of flooding water. These relationships tell us how much damage you could have to the home with one foot of flooding or 0.3 meters. And so as we see more inundation to the home, we can see a greater percentage of damage to the value of that home. And there is a similar curve that is used to look at uh, the relationship of flood damage to the contents of the home. And so uh, as you get more flooding uh, above that main floor threshold, you see a greater percentage of damage to the contents of the home. So those are two key indicators that we use to look at the potential uh, risk to the community here. And a little bit about what, what are these flood risks. The, the photograph on the top right is showing you a wave overtopping event. So waves interacting with the shoreline. Um, that would be uh, synonymous what we see on the left here where the waves are coming in. They're, they're interacting with a, either a vertical structure or a sloping rock structure. 
And if they, the lake's high enough and the waves are big enough, the water comes over the wall, as you can see on the right. And so that, of course, can happen across 90% of your shoreline that's, that's hardened. You still do have some locations, though, that feature beach environments and more of a sloping uh, situation. So that's where we're looking at wave run-up. So the potential for the waves to come in during storms, and they're going to run up this slope. And then if it's low enough, push water further uh, inland. And translating that to uh, sort of a 2D environment here, this is a portion of your shoreline. Everything that you see in blue is the potential extent of the flooding during that 100 year event. So the 1% the chance storm. And so what we can see, obviously we have high water in the lake, but where we have low lying areas, we have potential for the water to come between the properties uh, along Riverside Drive and then further to the south. So we have, because of the low lying nature of the community, the, the potential for these floodwaters to move inland is, is quite significant. And this is uh, one of the areas that's, that's more vulnerable. To put that in context as well, looking at, uh, at the um, Riverside Drive. So this is a cross section elevation of the road center lines. Uh, on the left is the town limit in the west and to the right is the uh, intersection of Riverside Drive Cove Road in the east. And that green line is the elevation of the road. And so we can see that the blue is the 100 year, that 1% chance lake level. So if the water gets over the properties along the lake, it's going to run and flood along Riverside Drive. And then with respect to the climate change impacts, the orange line is the higher 1% uh, chance climate change level. So you can see how that impacts the structures even more. The water is over almost all of Riverside Drive during this higher lake level associated with climate change. And Les Perrance here, so we get the similar type of story. We have um, the uh, intersection of Les Perrance Riverside, um, and you see that the road itself is quite a bit lower than um, the 100 year flood and, and of course lower than the, um, the climate change as well. So if the water can cross that barrier at the edge of the lake, the properties uh, and move inland, it's gonna to continue to propagate along the road network because it's a, a low lying area. So next we're gonna show you some of the numerical simulations. And so this uh, is a, a, again, a simulation of the extent of the flooding that could happen during this 1% chance or the 100 year storm. And all the shaded areas are showing you the, the extent of the water movement in land. So we're starting to see those cells populate and you get a sense pretty quickly that the water's running along the roads as it described. So in, in a lot of cases, the homes are high enough to not be impacted, not all cases, but definitely your road network is low and it creates a pathway for this water to move inland. And then, it, then we're gonna see the opposite, it's starting to dry out. The, the water is gonna start flow back to the lake. Your storm sewer system is gonna pump water back into the lake and we're gonna dry out. That, simulation creates on the order of 24 to 37 million dollars in damages to buildings and that's just buildings that's not um roads it's not electrical it's it's just the building infrastructure and that's based on uh importantly that's the assessed value from a couple of years ago so that's not market value prices um but that's the based on the assessed value. So we have a, a big impact um, just to one aspect of what's at risk. Of course, we know there's many other things that are that are at risk. And we'll go to this next one. And this is the, the amount of flooding that you would see during the climate change scenario. So we get into a wet period in the future and the lake exceeds the level it did in 2019. The flooding that we're seeing in this next visual is how far the water goes. And I think if we remember the previous, it's quite a bit farther. It's quite a bit deeper, uh, causing a, a lot more impacts. So the previous uh, simulation based on the historical extremes was 24 to 37 million. The, the damage to the buildings with this estimate is 124 to 188 million. So we have a dramatic increase with that extra foot of water because of the impacts of climate change. All 
All right, we're going to keep going through here and now talk about adaptation. So we, I think we get pretty clear sense that there are a lot of risks in the community and we'd like to make those risks go away. And so we spent a lot of time throughout the study working with your staff, a lot of work interaction with the public uh, during the online open houses uh, to look at adaptation options. What can we do to reduce these flooding hazards and reduce the risk to the community? Some of the options uh, are on the screen here uh, relate to modifying the shore protection, which we'll talk about further, uh, making the shore protection higher or, or building a little further out into the lake. So with this, this next graphic is showing you the extent of the flooding uh, during, this is scenario A, which is a 100 year flood, 100 year coastal flood based on historical extremes. So all the shading there are giving you the depths of flooding um, throughout the community. Um, if we uh, try to mitigate that risk with uh, modifying the shore protection and increasing the height of that shore protection, for example, uh, one of the targets we're using was 50 liters per second. So we want to reduce the, the amount of water coming over the structures. We would have to work on roughly 27 properties. We'd have to increase the average height of those seawalls by 0.2 meters. Um, that would cost us roughly a million dollars, but it could reduce your flood risk by five to seven million. So this would be a very positive project from an economic uh, benefit cost ratio perspective. Typically, if you're of a ratio one or higher, you, you have a viable financial project. This one has a ratio of five to seven. And the graphic on the left, the bar chart, these are just showing you the properties. Of course, we're, we're never going to show where the addresses are out of respect for the owners, but this is just giving you a sense from uh, west to east. These are the lots that are vulnerable, and if they were uh, mitigated, uh, we could reduce your your uh, flood damages by five to seven million if you spent a million uh, working on those lots. So then another threshold for us uh, is 10 liters per second. So this is the volume of water coming over the wall. If we can reduce that down to only 10 liters per second, which is an important engineering threshold, um, we see now the summary statistics. So um, we would have to work on more properties. The, all the bars in green are the lots that would need to be worked on. And that would total about 143 lots. The average increase in the height of uh, the protection increase would be half a meter. So on average, we have to make these walls half a meter higher. Uh, that would cost six to seven million, but you could reduce your damages by 21 to 32 million. So we'd be able to reduce the flood extents a lot. Uh, and still that would give us a, a benefit cost ratio of three to five. So um, obviously not an easy type of thing to do to work on 140 lots. Uh, there would be lots of conversations that would need to be had, and we can talk more about that tonight. Um, but these are these concepts that we developed and, and giving you some sense of what would be required and number of lots that need to be worked on. So scenario F, um, this would be a more aggressive approach. We could almost make the flooding go away uh, if we limited the flooding to, to two liters per second. That's really just the odd wave hitting the wall, spraying water over the crest. So we could make all your flooding go away. Uh, hypothetically, we'd have to work on 183 properties. Uh, the average height of those uh, improvements would be much higher on the order of about 0.8 meters. Some it would be have to even higher, obviously. Uh, that could cost nine to 11 million, but we could make the damages essentially go away. If we remember the, the number was 24 to 30, 37 million. So you could make all the flooding go away, you would require conceptually a lot of modifications to the backyards to keep that flood water in the lake. We also looked at uh, another option here, which we're calling a flood barrier along Riverside Drive. Now, uh, this was um, a concept that was never really fully brought forward because of the complexities. You can imagine um, building a, a barrier, some type of structure along. Uh, the major artery would be a major, uh, you know, undertaking, complicated, um, potentially unsightful, et cetera, et cetera. But just to get, put this in context, if you're not able to work with your property owners along the lake, if you were able to keep the floodwaters, limit that extent to Riverside Drive, and you could engineer it, not suggesting we should or we will, we want to go down that road, but hypothetically, if we did, 
uh, you could reduce your flood damages by 15 to 24 million. So just another option, um, obviously not without tremendous challenges, uh, but something we, we looked at uh, to some degree. All right, so then this is scenario C. This is the flooding, uh, the flooding extent with the climate change. And you can see all those blue blues are the extent of the waters, the reds, dark oranges, we have almost a meter of flood water depth. So a, a lot of impacts here with C. Uh, we looked at a few different ways to mitigate, but scenario J is the one that we're sharing here. So we could have this much flooding if nothing is done. If we were to limit all the overtopping volumes to 10 liters per second, we would have what we see on the map there. So it's a, quite a substantial reduction uh, if you went forward. And what would that involve? Uh, again, working on a lot of properties, 207, um, the walls would have to be increased on an average of a meter in height, could cost 12 to 13 million. Uh, but you could reduce your flood damages by 100 to $153 million. So these, I hope we realize, are, are big numbers. Um, you could create benefit cost ratio of 8 to 12. Again, just to put in context, um, and this happens more in the U.S. with flooding than in Canada with the FEMA program. If you have a benefit cost ratio of 1 or greater, and sometimes they even do 0.8, they'll fund your project. You have the potential to reduce your damages by the benefit cost ratio of eight to 12. So there is a lot of economic impetus to look at doing something to mitigate these flood risks with the members of your community. All right, in Riverside Drive, we again, we looked at this concept very conceptually. Um, yes, you could engineer something uh, would be very complicated, but you could keep the floodwaters limited to Riverside Drive, even for that climate change scenario, but would um, be a, a, an enormous challenge to do that. And, and what are we talking about here, just to kind of get a sense, because I'm sure you're wondering, well, what does this mean for the private properties and, and, and the municipally owned properties as well? And I'm sure that the landowners are wondering too, what, what, are, what are we talking about? Um, upgrading these seawalls. The, the graphic on the left is a good one where uh, you have a sheet pile wall at the water's edge and you're putting a concrete cap on top. So uh, you're just essentially making that wall higher to reduce the volume of water uh, going over top of it. And that's what we're showing here. You know, putting a cap on a, an existing wall or putting even a higher cap on an existing wall. So doing things in a continuous way, though, I think they have to stress this, is that if we we'll move forward with this, and of course, we've not done any of the planning at the you know the lot scale or the community scale to to move forward. Um, it would have to be a continuous project. You'd have to get everybody on board to do this. You can't have one or two weak links, otherwise you still have your flood risks. All right. And then there's other things too. There's lots of lots of options that to be creative, um, and we you want to be creative. These are people's backyards that they value tremendously. Uh, this is an example here in Burlington. If anyone's familiar with the waterfront, where there's a lower wall. Uh, and then we have this parapet wall. So we have an upper and lower level. So you could try to replicate something like that where you have your existing uh, infrastructure at the water's edge, maybe leading to a dock and then further set back, you have something that's higher that can be that additional line of defense. And, and we're showing that with a couple of sketches here on the right-hand side, uh, engineering type sketches. And then there could be situations where there's enough room that building some kind of a berm, um, a levee, uh, where again, where it fits uh, would be a way to keep the lake floodwaters in the lake. Uh, basement flooding, um, also uh, important. Um, and we know that there are, are risks here um, during a coastal flood of the sanitary sewer surcharging. Um, this was looked at to some degree with this work. Um, obviously, there's been lots of other things going on, important initiatives uh, in the in the community to, to look at basement flooding and update your sewer infrastructure. Um, the couple photographs on the on the lower right are ideas that um, came up on things that people could do to try to reduce the risk of basement flooding, which is uh, closing some of these lowest openings so that they're not vulnerable to flood waters entering the basement. All right, I think we're in the last section here, and then we'll get to some questions and public engagement. And this is last, but by by far not the least important, I would say the most important. And I think 
looking at moving forward, this is something that would be, again, the most important aspects because so much of this land along the lake that's vulnerable is, is in private hands. And so um, the public engagement was really important. This happened all during COVID, which was, as we remember, a, a big challenge. Uh, but we did have three meetings and I, I'm gonna walk you through some of the key aspects of these public meetings. And, and we had, considering we we're in COVID and the state of our world, we had really good turnout. We had 64 people, the first ones 46, 45 and 29. So we had a lot of people come out. What I'm listing here are, are some of the things we learned that are really relative, I think, to thinking about this in the context of what to do next. At that first public meeting, we asked people what their priorities were. And we found that 77% indicated that a long-term sustainable solution was a priority. Uh, we also found that 67, 69% felt that cost was important. And of course it is. It's going to, the cost of the impacts to the landowners will be important. 54%, a little bit lower, thought the cost to you guys would be important too. So it's nice for them to be thinking about uh, the town as well. Uh, cost, of course, is is a very important factor. Um, at the second pick, we we talked about a little more brainstorming about short and long-term solutions. Uh, we asked for feedback on that. And we heard about things like continuing with the important uh, pump station upgrades you're working on, um, looking at increasing the height of existing seawalls. So that was discussed. Uh, we There was some discussion about uh, policies around development and, and making sure that uh, there's no more development and building happening in these flood prone areas. And that if there is buildings, uh, perhaps, new rules around basements might be uh, important to ensure that there's we're not making the flood risk worse. Um, temporary storage basins, um, and then providing some more assistance, so knowledge sharing with landowners about how they can reduce their own risk for basement flooding. And then we pick three, we shared lots of these uh, flood maps, obviously, and the, uh, the ideas that I'm sharing with you here tonight. And we asked them what the preferred long-term approach was to reduce coastal flood risk. 58% suggested that a community scale program to upgrade existing shore protection was the preference. And I guess we're probably glossing over this a little bit from time from a time perspective, but I, I can't emphasize enough that we talked a lot about community scale. These types of things, if you move forward to try to mitigate some of these risks, it's everybody, right? This is an all of society approach. This is not on the backs of any one person. It's not just one lot. It's taking this, looking at this, this challenge at a community scale and making sure everybody's on board, everybody participates in the discussion uh, and then the solutions. So that was a big, big key finding there. And 17% um, flood barrier along Riverside Drive. Uh, and then 25% suggested other things that we should look at. So I think in general, uh, all these picks again during COVID, but we we got lots of valuable insight uh, throughout the, the public meeting uh, process. I think the attendance was very positive compared to other things we've done during COVID. Uh, but as we can realize, we certainly touched just a small amount of the people in your community because of the, the attendance. So there's lots of affected people, both along the shoreline and in the interior that were not part of these public meetings, uh, which could, could warrant further engagement on some of these topics. So a little bit here on next steps, and then we'll open up to some questions. Um, so, Existing activities and new initiatives. Um, so I think the key thing from my perspective, there's a lot of really positive things happening already in this community. Uh, very progressive, some of the work that's being done. Uh, and certainly continuing with that, continuing with the design work and the construction plans to upgrade the storm sewers and those pump stations. Um, those are great projects and you're being very proactive with that and that should definitely continue. Um, when it comes to basin flooding, uh, a multifaceted approach to reduce basement flooding from sanitary sewer backup. So again, that work's happening. Um, continue with that. It's important. People to be aware uh, and lots of different ways to deal with that. As far as new activities uh, working, and I, I saw some of them with us here tonight, uh, the emergency responders. Um, we have now, you have very detailed information on the depth of flooding on your roads. Uh, with these simulations, both based on historical extremes, but also the impacts of climate change. And so working with your first responders to understand those flood depths on the roads and the equipment you have to respond and, and 
care for people or care for fires. Those are important steps. And if, if that has not started, uh, that's certainly an important thing to, to move forward. In. And this, the sequence planning and, you know, where are my assets and what roads can I travel on and what can I travel on because of flood depths? Those are important things to, to work on. Uh, developing some more guidance for landowners on basin flooding. Again, the more that these uh, homeowners can help themselves with projects, the better. Um, and then the last bullet here, I've touched on a few times now, but um, if there is a desire, uh, further engagement with your landowners on the on this notion of a community scale approach. Um, we've, of course, believe in it. Uh, we showed you lots of examples. They can have a very positive impact. Um, but these are people's backyards and you obviously need to engage with them and talk to them and again, have everybody on board with the desire to move forward on this. And so, you know, I'm not suggesting the community is ready to go and start building these projects, but certainly um, you could be in a position moving forward to have further engagement and build off the positive things that we found from this study and, and have more conversations, more town hall meetings with your constituents that are impacted by flood risk. So I think uh, with that, Your Worship, I'm done with my slides and happy to have any questions. Thank you very much, Peter. And uh, um, uh, again, it, it's it's when you look at it, especially the heat sink maps and that it's <laughs> when you look at 20 percent uh, or, or up to 40 percent of your households, you know, being affected. And it's uh, uh, you want to stand up and take attention to that pay attention to it. One of the things in the, in the report too, that, that I haven't seen, and, and maybe you can maybe enlighten us a little bit too, is that uh, inland uh, through say Pike Creek, for example. And when we looked at the water levels, how high they were in 2020 and that, and I could attest that uh, all the way to Old Tecumseh Road and, and Brighton, the water was up to the road. And uh, uh, the one thing about St. Clair, if you have a sustained wind, usually the marsh winds, we have ice to help us, but now there's no ice. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a saucer. And and then you can see the lake level just tipping because of the, the impact of the water. We saw a little bit of that at Christmas time with the North shore of Lake Erie. Mm. And, and yes. um, uh, so you get that, you know, that a hydraulic lift almost, you know, and, and, and that area. So all the, the inland of, of Pike Creek is one issue, I think, um, you know, in terms of reinforcing, I know that one be more berming, I guess, and uh, than anything. And that, uh, that, that would be, I think, of interest. The other is, um, you know, you're only as good as your weakest link. And we identified that in the waterfront. We found that out in 2020 uh, and that, but your neighbors, City of Windsor on the other side, as well as um, Lakeshore. Um, again, we can be, you know, the whole frontal attack and done. What what happens here as well could be uh, certainly an impact. So, um, in in uh, is there an opportunity as well in, in in the report when you're dealing with obviously you're, you're going to be talking to Lakeshore. Uh, and and the uh, city of Windsor and the rest of the community in that and what interlocking opportunities that uh, that, that we can do because when you look at the numbers it's very very high cost uh, mm -hmm. for all of us and and uh, opportunities for us maybe collectively coming together and say apply for federal and, and provincial opportunities mm -hmm. uh, as a county for example or as a, a county slash city. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, certainly in those opportunities, but the biggest piece I think for us too is is all the tributary tours that we have. I mean, Essex County is flat like a pancake, yeah. and um, we're very dependent on uh, on proper drainage and so forth. So if you get the wind and you get the uh, the flood effect, you know, what can we do to protect ourselves uh, inland? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, those are great co questions and, and comments, Your Worship. I, I think that the riverine system certainly is. Uh is something you need to be aware of and it's you know florida is a great example where they're facing these huge challenges with all their intercoastal waterways right you know great to have them to be driving around on uh so yeah certainly looking at them would be part of this as well our, our focus on this study was largely the coastal flooding but i think if you were to move forward with further engagement you would certainly want to be talking to those landowners and business owners along the creeks as well so it's a very good point um, as far as the neighbors, uh, again, community is not limited to to your shoreline, as you mentioned. So I think it's a very good point. Uh, we have done a similar, maybe less, slightly smaller study with Lakeshore. So they're 
quite aware of where their flood risks are right now. Uh, others have worked in Windsor. So I think that um, the notion of trying to work at that community scale, including the whole South Shore of Lake St. Clair, is a really good idea. Um, because if you fix all of your challenges and your neighbors don't, then of course you might still have uh, flood risk. Uh, I think that's very welcomed, and and I have heard that uh, the county of Essex is looking at um, hopefully doing some floodplain mapping throughout the whole county. So that is an initiative that uh, will be an opportunity for everybody to be at the table and have updated flood risk maps. Uh, you obviously have quite a bit of work done here already, but that would be a, a unique opportunity, maybe a binding opportunity for people to come together and understand what your collective risks are. And uh, I do like the idea of thinking about looking at this uh, beyond just the city boundaries. I only wish we had the Army Corps of Engineers like they do in the United States, where you can, can have continuity throughout the, the you know, your, your, your total shoreline. But I think it's important for us to I'm glad to hear that you know the the county and 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 others are are, are actually going to come together because we're all we're all faced with the same same problem same issues yep. same climate. Yeah. Deputy Mayor and uh, uh, Councillor Houston and Councillor Jobin. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Peter, and you know, very very informative presentation in terms of all the. Uh, data that's collected here and and like you said earlier the, this is mostly a cost a coastal uh, flood report and in terms of the risk in one of your slides it talks about the preferred long-term approach my question you know to the general person viewing this and, and you showed the map you know those that live along riverside for example are the ones that are impacted the most because of shoreline protection and that shoreline protection, you know, there's the conservation authority, there's grants available for them to do their own, but on their own, it's not going to fit. It's got to be an overall plan. And I get that. But here, when you look at who pays that amount, you talked about damages, let's say it was 24 to 36 million. When you say that in general, is that damages to the area where private owners can recoup that from insurance? is what what falls on the back of the town because at the end of the day someone who lives in ward five is not impacted by this coastal but they're impacted by climate change weather you know there could be a, a tornado or hurricane their insurance covers that so i'm trying to understand the balance or the where the insurance plays a role where shoreline protection, the conservation authority, and like the mayor mentioned, the the governments, what role they play in? Because I, I I don't feel like it should be the town of Tecumseh. If we don't do this, there's going to be thirty six million dollars in damages, and you know mm -hmm. it's our fault. And so that I'm trying to wrap my brain around that is there's a lot more players involved here that needs to be at the table through the public engagement. So just a kind of a comment question in terms of what your thoughts are on mm -hmm. that. Yeah, well, it's a great question. So through your worship, um, I guess the first comment to make, generally for several decades now, there has not been funding for private property shore protection. That's something that happened in around the 1980s a little bit. You could get some grants. For the most part, uh, if you own property along the lake, you, you are responsible to, to protect your property from flood risk and, and erosion. Uh, that's still generally the case today. Um, the uniqueness here with your community, though, is that the actions that they take or don't take have such a significant repercussion in the interior. And so I think that's, that's sort of part of that equity question that I think you're getting at. Uh, we did not go too far on that, and I don't think we should have because um, this focus, the study was really focused on risk and hazards and what some of the mitigation concepts are. But I think as a whole community, as a council, with your staff supporting you, those are the types of questions that you might want to look at in the future. Uh, and you understand now the risk. The question is how to move forward in a respectful and an equitable way. Um, what I do see on the landscape is funding, and you've obviously received some through DMAF for these larger community scale projects. So you know, where where is the federal government at right now? Um, it's about taking this larger look at our at our communities. 
um, having everybody involved in, in co-developing solutions uh, and thinking about the ecosystem as well. So it's not just about people or infrastructure, but it's uh, what can be done to enhance the quality of Lake Erie, or Lake Erie, uh, Lake St. Clair, um, all your tributaries as well. So you want to have that. I'd suggest that you might go into this or really thinking about looking at the overall health of your coastal community. And that health would include private infrastructure, private buildings, municipal assets, but don't forget about the health of your beaches uh, and your water and your nearshore environments, because that's the type of um, lens that the funding partners are looking for you to take. So that holistic approach, uh, integrating nature-based solutions where you can, these are the things that governments are talking a lot about. So that would be something that you might uh, collectively look at in a next step. Thank you. And that, that kind of answers it. And I, like I said, you know, since 2016, when this all started, our, our, our town and our administration have been very proactive with flood mitigating uh, strategies in terms of purchasing assets uh, to mitigate that. So I want to thank, uh, you know, Peel's team and, and, and our CEO for, for pushing that as, as a need. Uh, because it's not going away and, and it can happen overnight. And, and looking at that graph, we're, we're right there at that same spot that we were there back in 1973, 1986. So yeah. thank you. Welcome. And the big piece too is the loss of insurance for, for folks. Uh, and that's the other big piece that we have to be cognizant of the fact too, because we've seen that after 2016 and 17, many of the homeowners uh, have not been able to uh, to purchase insurance, flood insurance. That's that's another point that we got to keep that in mind as well. Is that when you look at those catastrophic numbers, it's it's something to think about. Yes, very good point. Uh, thank you, Worship, and, and, and through you to Mr. Zuzik. It, it's a very eye-opening report, and um, uh, you know what really stood out for me was um, seeing that 1973 slide, right? And you mentioned. We are today where we were in 1973 and, you know, coming into this and looking at this information and, and being here at the table when we, we spent the money to put the money uh, to, to build the berm when, when the water levels were as high as they are, I, I sort of felt as though we're kind of out of the, you know, out, out of the danger zone because the lake level has come down a little bit, but uh, that that's not the case. And, you know, when I look at, um, the, you know, our, our area and into deputy mayor's point, it's, it's not a, it's not just a riverside piece. And I know making the, um, investment and being here at the table, um, realizing the threat that we had at that point, um, it's, it goes very deep into the municipality and, um, it, it is very unique. And to, to, to the mayor's point, I think this needs to be something which we need to, uh, tackle as a region because we could spend the eight to 10 to 12 million and protect ourselves. But if our neighbors don't do it, I, I, it's gonna be money just thrown away. And I, I really think we need to be working with our neighbors and it has to be a, uh, a, a full community approach to, to tackle this issue. And we know climate change isn't going away. Um, things will only continue to get worse. Um, so, you know, very eye opening and, you know, the, 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 a big piece of the picture, like we just mentioned is insurance, right? If, if we were to go ahead and do all these investments, you know, is insurance, are, are we going to be rewarded or, uh, are things going to get worse? Just, you know, climate change and everything. And I know there's a lot that, you know, goes into that whole insurance conversation, but, um, this is very eye opening, And I think it should be concerning to, you know, all of our residents that we have this, um, potential risk. And, and as you said, this just paints a, um, paints the picture for us to make future decisions. Uh, but I think it's something that we need to continue to um, keep our minds um, in tune to. So thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you through you. Good evening. Welcome. So I do have a few things. Um, so I guess the language you are using has actually, as you spoke and answered some of my questions on how this could be conveyed to the public, because I've had some experience with shoreline protection and shoreline property owners are specific to their sexy of being on the shore. And some of them have beach walkouts. 
So I find this, uh, the designs you've offered with the steel wall, um, that that would be something maybe difficult for them to maybe accept. And um, typically um, shoreline property owners when they were developing and in any development opportunities that they seek out, when they have to involve the conservation authorities or the town and flooding possibilities were discussed, they always found that to be irrelevant and untrue. It's never going to happen. And now it's happened. And some were um, in compliance with some of their protections, some not, some were with their development, some not. Um, so there's a lot, a lot involved. And when you say about community involvement and discussion, I do think we have to have a lot more of it. Um, but what resonated with me was when you said we are unique and it's the interior repercussions that will change the language because it is different. You're right, it's unique for us because I just feel like us putting um, a major cost and not doing the typical landowner full cost and us doing a shared cost may have some effect and maybe frustration towards non shoreline property owners. Mm -hmm. Is that understandable to council? So I'm I'm just looking at that that that, but I think the key words are the interior repercussions, which is important for us to observe this and and yeah, have some continued um, public discussions. Oh, for sure. Okay. All right, through your worship. Uh... Councillor, uh, some great comments. Uh, maybe just one point to reiterate: uh, at the at the scale of this analysis, we were not zooming into individual lots to sort of optimize the solution. So, the concepts that I showed you around making the wall higher, making a secondary wall uh, or a berm, those are very conceptual in nature, and those are done to enough detail to allow us to put a cost to them. But certainly recognize that anyone's backyard, whether you're in the in the middle of town or along the lake, it's your backyard and you care about it. And so that's where there's more work to be done to look at the, the viability of these solutions, um, how they could be customized, how they would um, work with the existing uh, infrastructure you have, whether it be a dock or a swimming platform. So certainly recognize that there would need to be much more uh, fine scale work done to uh, come up with solutions that are continue to be attractive and give the people the functionality they want with their backyard, uh, but also have a, a greater flood protection level to it. So that that's not the type of thing that we were asked to do in this body of work, but certainly that's the kind of thing that you could do in the future with further studies. Go ahead, uh, Councillor Egerson. Thanks very much, and through you, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Susek, thank you very much for being here and explaining this in a way that um, is digestible to uh, Councillor Jobin's point, not only to us, but to the community that it affects. Um, certainly looking through this uh, as a Ward 1 Councillor was very um, eye-opening for me. Um, and, and further to Councillor Jobin's question, um, you mentioned, which I appreciated, that the public engagement was um, was one of the most important parts of this, and that um, granted that it was happening during COVID, we did have really good turnout, but that more engagement is warranted. So I don't know if this question is to you or through administration and then including you. Um, so more engagement is warranted, and, and, and some of those questions about, you know, uh, trying to get full community on board um, and in some of the ways that we can uh, do this and and to Councillor Houston's point, um, our neighbors as well. Um, where do we go from here? We're going to receive this report today and, and what happens and how do we communicate out to our, our constituents and our neighbors that we're looking to continue to have conversations on this in the hopes that we can get to something that is um, uh, palatable from a cost perspective and also from a long-term um, uh, climate change response uh, perspective as well. We'll get our director of public works. Uh, thank you uh, through your worship uh, to Councillor Higginson. Um, I believe as part of the next steps, um, we'll be looking at uh, trying to integrate, I think, uh, some of the next steps into our public works, capital works plan uh, in the coming years uh, with respect to uh, like an implementation plan uh, that would be uh, very focused on public engagement, consultation, 
and um, uh, really just trying to uh, identify the level of service or the level of risk uh, that we're willing to move forward with and then how that would impact uh, some of these individual properties and what those associated costs would be. And, and then actually how to, actually, uh, how to uh, fully implement this. Um, you know, uh, Mr. Zuzik did mention uh, some grant programs that are out there uh, currently. I, I think we'll continue to see those uh, grant programs uh, continue in the future as well. And, um, and so just, just trying to uh, move forward with the mitigation plan um, and, and seeing which way council would like to go and, and the public, uh, essentially. Thanks. I appreciate that. Um, and, and I, I'm hoping that there will be, um, a bit more engagement, although we did have really good engagement during COVID that, that if we kind of did a, a, uh, a series of public meetings where <laughs> these maps were blown up in front of people and you could pinpoint your own house on it. Um, uh, hopefully we can see some, um, some engagement from our, um, Mark, not only our, our own residents, but um, from those uh, neighboring municipalities as well. And hopefully um, we can engage with our federal and provincial partners to, um, to look into some of those joint solutions too. So I appreciate that. The other thing too, that uh, people have to understand, we looked at the map, you know, do the, you know, we looked at surface flooding, looking at the lake coming over and so forth. But you have to remember too, the infra our infrastructure, most of our infrastructure is in, is in the danger zone. It's all along the water waterfront. So we have to protect that, you know, and, and, uh, to your point, uh, Deputy Mayor, when look at it, well, you know, what is it in for us? But that, that equipment now is, is needed. The other, the other point too, is that, um, it's how water migrates. Okay, you got the surface water. Now you got to think about uh, that means the lines are full, the storm sewer is full, the sanitary, hopefully it's not, I hope the rain gauges or rain caps are doing the job. But it's also now the flooding of basements further on. And, and uh, you know, there's not much talked about that. It's not just you know, you're looking at the, that the dark blue and that's the surface water and the flooding of those homes. But as you keep moving back uh, beyond uh, even the, the, the CN rails, and, and that's what happened in, in, in those years previous, is that basements were flooding. You had basements flooding in, in Ward 4, yeah, you know, in 16 and 17. And water uh, has to, that water has to make its way to the lake. And if the lake is saying, no, I'm not going to accept any more of your water and then your, your pumps are not working or, so, you know, that's why it's so important for us to protect that. That's the other, the other uh, effect, because I know when we did the heat sink first, when we did the, the berming, if you recall, we did two pieces. We did the one like the surface and then, and the effect of uh, the subterranean uh, flooding. And, and that's where it was, you know, adding a far more houses, you know, into, uh, into, a, you know, flood area. So there, there's a whole host of things that really can come to play. Uh, and that's why, number one, if we can stop water from coming over, that's, that's uh, the big one. And uh, um, so you got, again, the two events, I think you alluded to that in, in the report very clearly, the wind and then the rain events themselves and the lake levels going up. So the, a perfect trifecta of, uh, uh, of issues. And I think um, if you recall, members have been here before, our, our uh, surveys that we had done, our customer satisfaction survey, what was the biggest hit uh, on the last one on people's minds? And it was fresh, it was flooding. What are you doing? What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? And, you know, in terms of protection, I mean, it was, uh, uh, as you recall, we had about 600 demands for backflow preventers and so forth. Everybody was on their, certainly on their mind. But to your point, uh, Mr. Suzek, it, it, you know the 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 engagement. I think it's it's you know I mean you don't want to put fear in people, but you want them to be cognizant, you know, and be ready. And that's the whole thing. It's it's not when you got three feet of water, you know, in the living room. Uh, that you decide, well, we should have done something and so forth. So there's a, there's a lot of a lot of pressure on on uh, on council, and you know, in terms of um, where folks are going to say, you know, what are you doing to protect us? But I always go back to the survey, and the survey at that time, the number one issue 
concerning folks was flooding. Go ahead, uh, Councilor Dorner. Thank you, and uh, and uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, in terms of everything here is like a permanent uh, solution to stop uh, like uh, flooding in terms of berms and whatnot. Is there like a temporary thing, like a Hesco Bastion or some kind of thing that we can lay out and just to like temporary stop the uh, flooding until like uh, the event's over? Yeah, great question through through your worship, uh, Councillor. Uh, we did look at some temporary options and there is some things that are more prevalent in Europe, things you put up and you take down. So in some cases there'll be waterfront communities that will have a, uh, the ability to put up a temporary wall, uh, you know, the knee wall four feet high, and then you take it down. Um, we explored that a little bit with respect to Riverside Drive. You know, could you do something on Riverside Drive? Um, and quickly, your staff, who are, you know this community very well, spoke to the many challenges of having sort of a, a response type event, something you got to go install. So uh, I don't think we found a, a lot of options that really worked well in your community that you'd have to implement. Um, there are some places that have riverine flood risk where they have flood gates that can open and close inflatable uh, dam structures. Uh, but those options really don't work that well. And so I think where we focus most of our energy were on permanent solutions that were in place and didn't need to be uh, implemented during uh, a coming flood. All right, yeah, understood. Thank you. You're welcome. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, further to what uh, Councillor uh, Higginson had mentioned, I'm uh, I'm thinking it's likely valuable for us to pass this information along to our neighbors. So if we can include it so that their councils and their administration um, see this, I, I think it's valuable. It's my, my initial thought was, you know, to Phil, maybe you can pass it along to your, um, you know, your counterpart so they have the information, but uh, then it's not in the eyes of, of, of their council. So I think it's appropriate if we, you know, forward this along so that their councils can see and, and maybe that will um, spark so, some of the regional uh, conversation and also to the, to the county to make sure that the county has and sees this information because I, I know this will not be a quick and easy fix. And there are many, many other priorities that we have, which um, uh, are, are uh, much higher on the list, but I don't think this is something that we can absolutely ignore, but I think the solution is going to be very difficult, a very difficult one to, um, uh, to deliver, but I, I think valuable to get it in our neighbor's eyes. So if we can do that. Um, uh, through the mayor to Councillor Houston, um, I, I like your suggestion. However, I uh, suggest that we we um, revisit our working group. Uh, we had quite an extensive uh, working group uh, amongst our neighbors and, and uh, utilities during uh, our, um, you know, high flood alert days and uh, perhaps uh, Perhaps we start there and and uh, investigate a, a way to bring this more effectively to the the elected officials' attention in the neighboring jurisdictions. And I'm good with that. So thank you. My final question, uh, Peter, uh, is uh, uh, when will you present the uh, the counties? You know, the the South Shore in particular, Leamington, Kingsville, Amherstburg. Sorry, when will I present this to yeah. them? Or uh, don't really have a mandate to present this any further. Okay. Um, as I said, there is uh, some plans being led by the county to update your flood maps in all of Essex County. So, as that progresses, that might I think that might be a okay. good venue where you can engage with the county at that level. Um, and then all of your member municipalities and towns to um, speak about this larger issue. So that's not something that I'm involved with okay. at this point, but that's something that could come up that might be an opportunity for that. So that tells me then we're well advanced compared to others. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for the report. Uh, obviously, I think this is uh, very timely and uh, it's something that, uh, you know, council, especially when we go into our strategic planning session, 
is something that we can discuss uh, certainly uh, because this is something that's going to take multi years to uh, you know put in play and uh, but it's something that I think we uh, we now kind of see um, the weak links and uh, where we need to go. And I, I know we've, we certainly dodged a bullet in 2020. Uh, and, and I say that very loosely, but it was, uh, you know, uh, we had some days that uh, the wave action was, was actually coming over and we kind of plugged the holes uh, at the right time. And, and, you know, at that time, but that's, that's not going to uh, take us to uh, the climate change level that you alluded to in, in that regard. So thank you. Uh, for uh, for a comprehensive report and thank you uh, as well to public works and getting this thing uh, you know on uh, on the board for us so with that if I could have a motion that we uh, receive the report that's presented Council Jobin Council Houston all in favor oppose if any uh, that is uh, carried and with that uh, no further questions or comments adjournments in order Councillor Higginson Councillor Tonio all in favor? Oz Feni, that is carried. Thank you. Thank you very much.